you. Welcome everybody. Uh, we have a very special speaker, Dr. Kutnuyan today. Thank you, Dr. Kutnuyan, for taking your time out of your busy day to talk to us about um, issues people can have with their hearing and their ear canals. I really appreciate your doing this, and I know it isn't easy uh, virtually, um, but I think we'll go ahead and get started, and I'll have you uh, introduce yourself and what it is you're going to talk about today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, thanks to COVID, we got used to doing things virtually. Uh, and thanks to my staff, I'm learning how to use all the gadgets. So I want to thank my assistant, Stephanie, who put these slides together for me. And uh, I'd like to also acknowledge my uh, sources for this talk. Uh, the American Academy of Otolaryngology, the American Tinnitus Association, and uh, the information, the, the slides, most of the slides from Dr. Sweeto, who's an audiologist in San Francisco. Uh, the reason we chose tinnitus as a topic is because it's a, it's a very common concern uh, I see in the practice. I'm a general otolaryngologist in Glendale. I've been in practice for almost 25 years. And um, the, uh, one of the common concerns that we see in the office related to the ear is tinnitus. And so today my talk is going to be on the, uh, the common causes of tinnitus, uh, general understanding of how to manage it. And I think at the end, I want everyone's uh, take home message to be that although tinnitus could be annoying and disruptive at times. Uh, it doesn't indicate something ominous, but of course we'd like to get a handle on it, so we will expand. Uh, before we talk about tinnitus, I want to see if I can play this video, uh, which tells us about hearing and what hearing is. So please take a listen for about two minutes. Have you ever wondered how sounds make their way from the source? all the way to your brain? Take a trumpet, for instance. When it's played, it makes sound waves in the air. The outer ear catches the waves, which then travel through a narrow passageway called the ear canal. The sound waves reach the eardrum, which is a membrane roughly half the size of a dime. They make the eardrum vibrate, which in turn vibrates three tiny bones called the malleus, incus, and stapes. These bones amplify or increase the sound vibrations and send them to the cochlea. The cochlea is shaped like a snail and is the size of a garden bee. It is filled with fluid and the sound vibrations make this fluid ripple, which creates waves. The video. You don't see the video, do you? No, no. Oh. Hang on one second. Maybe if I play it from my Share audio, maybe. I'll play it from the laptop. Let me see if it'll allow me to play it from the laptop. I don't know. Okay. If you can't share your the one that you're on Zoom on. Um. Tell me again. So if could he send us the link and we could share it with the members who attended? Okay. You know what? If you if you share send us the link, we can send it to everyone that attended today, and they can see it afterwards. Okay, that'd be nice because it's going to be too it's too complicated to, with so many screens. Okay. okay, so I'm going to then forget about this. Uh, just close this, right? Well, I, I'll do it later. But let's go to the. You can continue the audio if you want. How do we go back to my original slides? Okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, can you is, is the slide back on now? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. It's perfect. Okay. I, I apologize. I no. Problem. I wanted to share the link with you because it it's a very nice explanation about uh, how the ear works. So I'll try to do this uh, uh, by just describing to you, and I'll send the link afterwards. So um, when you, you think of the ear, I think it's important to realize that the ear is not a one-way sensory organ that only sends information to the brain. 
just like any organ in the body, there is a two-way communication between the ear and the brain. The, um, so the organ of hearing, the cochlea, sits in the inside our outer ear. Uh, so if the sound uh, comes to our ear, it travels through the ear canal, it hits the eardrum, it vibrates three little bones behind the eardrum, and then those mechanical vibrations translate to the vibrations of the fluid in the cochlea. So the cochlea is inside our um, temporal bone. When the fluid in the cochlea moves, there are nerve endings that are floating in this fluid. So the movement of the fluid moves these little hair cells in the nerve endings, which then cause chemicals to be released from these nerve endings. And these chemicals cause the conduction of sound from the ear to the brain. Okay, so just uh, in a nutshell, when the mechanical sound comes and reaches our ear, it's conducted, it's converted to an electrical stimulation and the electrical stimulation carries noise to the brain. At the same time, the brain is constantly communicating with the ear, just like it's communicating with every other organ, your fingers, your toes, your heart. So the brain has a big role on how the cochlea behaves, how the little muscles in the middle ear behave. So it's not only one setting. Imagine it's like a stereo. You have control of the volume uh, and the amplifier uh, is controlling all the little things that your device can do. So the brain is controlling how much noise to allow to the ear uh, and how, in addition to processing what you hear, it's also controlling the actual mechanical sound, all right? So having, having said that, so what is tinnitus? The tinnitus is the perception of sound when no actual external sound is present. And often, you know, people say ringing in the ear, but it's not always ringing. The sound mm -hmm. could be ringing, buzzing. Was there a question? Hello? No, it's fine. Okay. Uh, no, it, um, doctor, you can open your chat, uh, and but we're not going to have questions until the end. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but can I just uh, continue? I, I thought someone Wait, was... Yes, yes, yes. And people can, they're used to putting questions in the chat, and they know that when you're all finished, that you'll read the questions and, and answer okay, for them. Good. Thank you. Right. So... The, the noise that people hear is not always ringing. It could be buzzing, hissing, swooshing, clicking. Um, but it's basically, the tinnitus then is the perception of sound where no sound exists. Now there are some um, audible noise that people hear in the ear as well. So we call that objective tinnitus as opposed to subjective tinnitus, which is the most common kind, almost 99% of tinnitus is subjective. In other words, only the person perceives it. We can't see it, we can't test for it, but there is also something called objective tinnitus. And that's usually a result of either mechanical blood flow, because as you can imagine, the brain is sitting immediately above the heart bone, which is called the temporal bone, and that uh, blood of the brain needs to drain just past the ear. So if the venous pressure in the brain is elevated and there are reasons for it we can address later. You can hear the actual swooshing sound of the blood. And um, that's easy to test for. Another type of uh, objective tinnitus is the little muscle spasms that could occur in the middle ear. And when the little muscles of the middle ear ossicles go into spasm, you can hear like a fire iron, pop, 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 And that's usually a, uh, uh, an indication that the little muscles are going into spasm, just like one's uh, leg muscles may go into spasm uh, during the sleep. Okay, so that's uh, tinnitus. And there are many different ways and uh, questionnaires that people have developed to understand how tinnitus affects a person. So how it affects them, 
what type of um, psychological distress it causes, how it affects their day-to-day -day functions. And these are just some examples of these types of questionnaires that have been developed. So the reason I wanted to explain to you at the very beginning to think of the ear as a two-way organ and not just a sensory organ is because tinnitus, of all things, is not just the function of a one-way communication between the ear and the brain. It's very much a two-way communication. At least 70 plus percent of people with hearing loss will have tinnitus. But not everyone with tinnitus is bothered by the tinnitus. So let me say those numbers again. More than two thirds of people who have hearing loss have tinnitus. But not everyone with tinnitus is bothered enough to come and talk to us or seek uh, help. On the other side, almost 90% of people with tinnitus have some hearing loss. So common things come being common. If someone says I have ringing in my ear without an obvious mechanical uh, uh, cause, such as a blood flow problem or a muscular problem, uh, I could assume that most likely that person has some type of hearing loss. And obviously the older we get, we have more hearing loss and therefore the segment of the population that is most affected by tinnitus uh, is the elderly, as well as those who are exposed to loud noise, whether they're musicians or work in the in construction, jackhammers, drills, loud machines, servers, presses, and the military. So these are the segments of the population that we see most with tinnitus. Uh, the elderly, folks who work in construction, the military, and musicians. Now there's also another category, people who are exposed to ototoxic medications. Um, this was more common about 40, 50 years ago with the new antibiotics at the time, genomycin, tobromycin, but those aren't used much these days, or if they're used, they're used carefully, but there are some uh, chemotherapy medications that are ototoxic. Okay, so what are contributors of, what are the factors that would make one person be bothered by their tinnitus or another person not bothered by the same tinnitus, the same noise. Some of it could be some maladaptive cognitive strategies, our brain's ability to uh, signal out certain things in our body that are out of balance. Uh, same way two people can have back pain and one person is much more affected uh, by the back pain than the next person. Another could be our ability to habituate. And I'll, I'll explore this a little bit more about what habitu habituation is and how it works. But it's basically our inability to adapt to tinnitus or any other disruption. The third would be our ability to either pay attention or shift our att attention away from uh, the tinnitus. And then the la la last item is how do we perceive tinnitus uh, affecting us emotionally? How, how do we react to this noise emotionally? Uh, as you know, sound or music is a very powerful um, um, limbic system stimulant. It affects our emotions and we'll go into this in a minute. And it, it's not just the outer, outside sound or music that we listen to, but the noise within our head or the tinnitus also affects us emotionally and different people process this stimulation very differently. And we'll explore this in a minute as well. So why does tinnitus start? Um, and I, I mentioned earlier that people who have hearing loss, the elderly or those who are exposed to loud noise or other toxic medications are more likely to have tinnitus. Well, what happens when you have hearing loss or you have exposure to loud noise or autotoxic medications. The function of the individual hair cells in the cochlea gets disrupted, and in many different ways. Different areas of the cochlea may get disrupted, and the disruption of the individual nerves would, could be at different degrees. So when there is a disruption in the cochlear hair cells, the input from the cochlea 
to the brain is disrupted. And uh, so that's the first kind of precondition for tinnitus. The second um, element that uh, augments this, this particular problem is when you, then, you don't have enough sound stimulation that goes from the cochlea to the brain, there is a decrease in inhibition of the normal brain function. What, what I mean by this, normally when we hear sounds, a portion of our brain that is involved in hearing and processing uh, quiets down, it's inhibited. But when that portion of the brain is not stimulated, it sort of gets excited because it wants to get stimulation. The brain is designed to have a certain amount of stimulation. So as, as we get older and we don't hear as well, or if our hearing is damaged and we're not stimulating the portions of the brain that are used to receive stimulation, they're going to start sort of acting out. And other dysfunctions in the brain will cause the same thing. Another element that could uh, trigger or aggravate tinnitus would be any type of anatomic disruption of our neck, TMJ or the temporal mandibular joint, any type of misalignment because the brain is constantly monitoring the position of your skull to the spine, the position of your jaw to the rest of your skull. And if any, there's any type of disruption, um, uh, this may aggravate the perception of tinnitus that you have. And of course, ultimately, your emotional state, if you are all wired, upset, nervous, sleepless, depressed, your brain is going 100 miles an hour, you're going to be affected. You're going to be disturbed more by the tinnitus than if you were relaxed on a vacation, not having a worry in the world. The noise may be there, but your brain is much, would be much busier enjoying other aspects of whatever is around you. Um, so stress, fear, threat, your fear of tinnitus and your fear of other things would be, would be affecting how tinnitus ultimately affects you. I'm hearing a noise in the system. Okay. Uh, the tinnitus also affects the activities of the brain. And we know that because when we do EEGs of the brain, we can see that uh, the activity of the entire brain could be affected by tinnitus. So if, we, if someone comes and says, I have tinnitus, how, how do we address it? Uh, there are, we have three broad tools. We can address the tinnitus by working with the mechanics of the sound, and we'll talk about this, and it's basically is divided into two types. One would be masking, and another one would be uh, suppression. And, and I'll distinguish these two because I think it's an important, uh, uh, there's an important difference between these two processes. The second one is we try to focus the person's attention away from the tinnitus. And lastly, we try to address the emotional component. Counseling is a very big component of how do you manage tinnitus. And counseling could be as simple as the person uh, understanding that this is not dangerous. Uh, and it could involve deep breathing exercises, stretching, relaxation, uh, 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 prayer, yoga, whatever uh, it helps to bring down the uh, anxiety level that exists either as a result of tinnitus or overall. So the three areas we want to focus on, the mechanical sound issues, the person's attention and focus, and the emotional state. And we also want to be able to describe uh, tinnitus. We want to know how often, how long does it last? Is there a particular trigger that brings it on? Um, do they know that? certain emotional states uh, make them uh, more aware of their tinnitus. And then how does it, how does tinnitus affect people? Some people say, oh yeah, I have this noise. It's there all the time. I hear it at night, but I can sleep just fine. And other uh, 
other patients may say, the tinnitus is so loud that it disrupts me. I can't sleep. I can fall asleep. Uh, and then we have to be able to describe the tinnitus and also describe how it's affecting the particular uh, patient, the individual. So um, I think this is kind of the same information in a, presented in a different way. We talked about the physical causes of tinnitus, which would be mechanical disruption of the nerves. And I think I forgot to mention viral illnesses. Uh, you all know that you know, certain viral illnesses in the past, such as you know, mumps, uh, rubella, measles, uh, could uh, affect hearing, among other things. Certain medications, uh, professional noise exposure, neurotoxins, and we talked about the mechanical um, skull, spine um, disruptions and movement that could also cause uh, people to be more aware and be more bothered by their uh, tinnitus. And stress is always present in, in most conditions that we see. Uh, again, this is a review slide. We want to make sure we reassure the patient, talk to them, help them understand why they have the noise, and then try to engage them in one of several different um, treatments or therapies, including being able to change their focus, including being, being able to bring down the level of stress that they have. And then uh, we're going to spend a little extra time on, on sound or music and how to use music. At the very bottom, you see the last item there is fractal tones. I think that's a very interesting concept that's been explored more and more in the last decade uh, as, a, as a method to suppress uh, the tinnitus. So there are many different gadgets or devices that generate noise. Some of them are called noise generators. Um, just regular music is one way uh, to suppress, to, to mask the noise and music could be uh, manipulated in certain ways. And there are companies, hearing aid companies and non-hearing aid companies that use particular types of music processed in a certain way to suppress tinnitus. So, so let's talk about the difference between masking and suppression. Masking is when you, I have tinnitus, the tinnitus bothers me. I turn on music, I listen to something, a, a piece that's playing passively, not, not actively listening to a symphony, but it's playing in the background. And my brain hears the music. And because my brain is listening to the music and the music is most likely louder than the tinnitus, the tinnitus that I have, I don't pay attention to that tinnitus. So that is called masking. If I'm hard of hearing and I'm using hearing aids, hearing aids act like masking devices because when I put the hearing aids on, I hear the world much clearer. I can hear cars moving in the streets. I hear my family in the other room, I may, I may hear the TV and, and the birds chirping. And those are all masking uh, sounds that cover the noise that's inside of my head and I don't pay attention to the uh, noise. Now, suppression is a little bit different. Suppression is an intentional um, stimulation of parts of the brain so that when that portion of the brain is stimulated, it inhibits the portion of the brain that's generating the tinnitus. And the way that works is usually, again, the, that, music, that sound, let's say, it's not just simple music, it's not FM radio, but it's an actual sound, it's a processed sound, uh, stimulates the part of the brain. It is at a very low volume. It's not loud enough to mask, but it's, presented in a certain way where it suppresses portions of the brain so that they can inhibit the generation of noise. And then there are different types of, you know, different folks, different companies that have different types of CDs, um, you know, ocean sounds and, and raindrops and their actual tinnitus uh, treatment uh, uh, CDs where people use to either achieve masking or suppression. 
and I won't get into the details of the difference between complete masking, partial masking, but you can have music in a room that is so loud that you won't hear anything. That's called complete masking. Or you can have music that's playing in the background, but it's not so loud where you can still hear and you can still participate in your work and conversations with others. So that's the difference between um, masking and complete or partial masking. And, and suppression is a very effective method to drown out tinnitus. Masking is the simplest thing. You go home, keep the music on all day, all night, even when you're sleeping. Suppression, you need to work with a professional often to be able to get the right program that is working and effective for you. And there are particular audiologists who uh, specialize in, in, in just suppression and habituation because they get involved with the psychological aspects, the physical aspects, both. Because you do, you do one without the other, the, the, the individual will be disappointed. So habituation is the process of ignoring the stimulus without exerting any conscious effort. You know, it's like if you have a wedding band, you're not thinking that you have a wedding band, you don't feel it because your body has habituated. Or if you're sitting on a chair, you don't feel that you're sitting on a chair because your body is habituated. In the same token, you could habituate your brain that you have the tinnitus, it's there, it's not going away, but you don't, you don't focus on it. And that's one way to assist someone uh, with tinnitus. Um, not all music affects us the same way. Um, the beats, the frequency, whether it's a high pitch or a low pitch, the rhythm, the tempo, uh, the loudness, um, all affect our emotions. And all of us know this because a certain piece of music makes us happy and energetic and another type of music kind of relaxes us and, and makes us more kind of uh, 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 emotional perhaps. So uh, these different elements of music are used in the uh, ap particular applications when it comes to uh, addressing uh, tinnitus. And when, you, when one listens to music, it stimulates the entire brain. So every aspect of the brain is affected one way or another, but our emotional center is very active when we're talking about tinnitus. So for the purpose of this conversation, um, we have to also realize that uh, music and tinnitus treatment uh, programs all affect our emotional uh, uh, state. Music is everywhere from work, home, hospitals, hotels. This is just a picture of the brain that shows us where the uh, center of music and music affecting our emotions are. It's in the center of the brain. It's not on the outside, but it's near the center. It's a very primitive part of the brain, as you can imagine. Um, the, when the tempo or, or the beat is more or less around the, our heart rate, that seems to be a very relaxing uh, tempo. And so tinnitus formulas, uh, tinnitus devices usually incorporate that. And then there's a, a comfort in having a repetitive uh, music or repetitive tone. It's not necessarily repetitive doesn't mean it's predictable. It's not the same sequence over and over and over again, but usually um, it's, uh, think of it like you know chimes, uh, the sounds of the chime that are long and soothing and they are the same sounds, but presented in different orders. So it's not fully predictable. There has to be a little um, variety in the way these sounds are presented. So um, I'm going to give you some examples of uh, pieces of music that are believed to be very um, effective in, in bringing, it's kind of relaxing the individual who, who listens to them. And you can see uh, the Concerto by Bach, uh, the Vivaldi's Winter, 
uh, Canon indeed, Paco Bell, um, the list is on the screen. So the, the, what do they have in common? Um, they have the particular beat that's a, sorry, that was my phone. Uh, there's a particular beat that our brain appreciates and it has a very relaxing effect. And cultural, there are cultural uh, differences too. If one type of music is relaxing, relaxing in a certain environment, it may not have the same effect in uh, another environment. Uh, even a musical key, you know, the major keys versus the minor keys have different effects emotionally. So all of this could be manipulated when we're addressing uh, tinnitus. So just a couple of words on, on fractal tones. Um, Fractal tones, think of them as uh, chime uh, uh, music. Uh, uh, and it's, it's very, uh, it's not repetitive, but it is um, expected. It, it's sort of, it, there's not a beginning and an end. It's continuous uh, tones, but without a particular repetition. So if you think of fractal examples in nature, think of the clouds. You see the clouds, but there's not a beginning and an end of the clouds, but it's very soothing as it's everywhere, or a mountain range, or um, you know, snow, snowflakes. Um, so the principle of fractal tones is used in treating tinnitus because it has a calming effect and it's very effective in uh, bringing on the uh, inhibitory function uh, of the portions of the brain to kind of inhibit that annoying, uh, distracting tinnitus. Thank you. So uh, most tinnitus uh, treatment programs have a counseling component so that we can address the emotional elements. Uh, it's important that the patient is able to relax and focus their energy uh, away from tinnitus. And we use one or more types of sounds, whether, whether it's a masking sound, which is kind of a very passive uh, or an active suppression sound to tell the brain to start behaving differently so that the tinnitus is no longer as disruptive as it was. Different type of relaxation exercises, whether it's deep breathing, guided imagery, muscle relaxation and others. Uh, so uh, I think it's been half an hour. And um, in, in closing remarks, I want to say that uh, tinnitus is a very common problem. Most of us will experience tinnitus. Um, most of us will experience tinnitus uh, at some point in our lives, particularly as we develop some hearing loss as we get older and um, uh, if our careers uh, included, you know, had some industrial noise exposure, music or chemicals. Uh, it's important for us to recognize that while tinnitus could be with us for many, many years, we can learn how to either shift our focus, um, reduce the anxiety related to tinnitus, and then um, uh, rely on music as a tool or particular types of sounds to um, mask or suppress the noise so that tinnitus is not a disruptive presence. Uh, be aware that it doesn't hurt to learn about your particular tinnitus. Most tinnitus is benign, nothing to worry about, but we do sometimes find real causes of tinnitus associated with hearing loss. Uh, whether it's some sort of an infectious process or some sort of a, a mass or a tumor that's affecting the nerve of hearing, but those are very rare and uncommon, but those are easy things to test for. Thank you. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Dr. Kutnuyan, this is Melissa here. Uh, just a question, is, is a runny nose related to tinnitus? No. So... <laughs> Uh, when we made the topic, I thought that I would cover both because that's also another common problem. Mm -hmm. And then as I started putting the slides together, I realized 
there was so much information and I thought it would be just a running mixture of different unrelated topics. So uh, unless someone has a particular question about running those, I almost think it's best if we stop here and then leave that for another time. I, you know what, that's a great idea. Would, would, would you would you like to come back and do the runny nose another day? Why don't we we take that after the <laughs> after the chat session? Uh, yeah. So um, so to all of our members and everybody that's tuned in with us today, um, please put whatever questions you have in the chat, and then Doctor, um, you're welcome to to open the chat and just read the questions and answer them to the best of your ability. Sure. Thank so you. Okay, thank you. Let me know if I miss someone or if I uh, skip over a question. Okay, will do. Thanks I'm, so much. I'm bringing it up from the top. Okay, so I think we already answered the runny nose is